evidence-based with evidence-based um, acupuncture. So in today's live webinar, you're going to learn more about this absolutely fantastic organization. You're going to understand how you can make the best use of the resources. And you're also going to learn um, some, basically have an introduction in how you can better communicate um, evidence about acupuncture. We do have time um, at the end for your questions. So please do use the chat box in the bottom middle of the screen um, and we will answer as many of these as possible. Um, Sandro has also very, very kindly said that he will um, answer any questions that we've not um, managed to, to get to by the end of the session. Now, today's session starts now and it will run on until 8 30 p.m. UK time precisely, um, after which point we will all turn in to pumpkins. Um, I'm now absolutely thrilled to introduce you to um, tonight's speaker, Mr. Sandro Grasser. He is one of the directors of evidence-based acupuncture. And um, I actually need to take a bit of a deep breath here because um, Sandro has quite a lot of credentials. So here goes. He is a lecturer a researcher. He's a fellow of the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine. Um, his master's um, with the Northern College of Acupuncture and Middlesex University focused on acupuncture for polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, originally from Portugal, um, Sandro moved to Ireland um, where he graduated from the Irish College of TCM, um, from where he obtained his licentiate in TCM, um, furthered, um, followed rather by further training at the Beijing University of Chinese Medicine. Phew, I managed to get through all of that. But yet it continues. Um, Sandro is a lecturer on the online MSc program at the Northern College of Acupuncture. And he's one of the researchers on the Cochrane Review Group for Acupuncture for Assisted Reproductive Technology. And to cap all that, he's also the director for the international membership of the Obstetrical Acupuncture Association. A very, very warm welcome and lots of love to you, Mr. Sandro Grasser. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I wasn't I wasn't nervous until now. So thanks for that. Um, now I am a little bit more nervous, but um, I have to uh, live up to the expectations of all that. Um, it's great to see some of the names actually in the room and recognizing some of the names, obviously seeing the faces even better. But um, seeing some of the names and going, oh, yeah, I recognize. And, and yeah, we really, really miss that connection over the last while of seeing everyone. So thank you for being here is the first thing that i want to say i am going to start sharing my screen and making sure that everything is working for you all just move this out of the way and go back to this one here okay so yeah first and foremost i just want to say a big big thank you to obviously everyone for being here and also for being invited to do this because for those that have been checking out over the last couple of weeks one of the um I've been lucky enough to have a paper out recently, and this was actually something that was mentioned on that particular paper of having um, associations and special interest groups actually engaging uh, more actively with research and researchers as well coming uh, online to showcase what they're doing so that more people from the coalface, from those that are in clinic, can actually, we can talk to each other. And just as a, 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 almost like a disclaimer, I don't spend as much time in clinic as you all do. And um, I still go to clinic, but my, mainly my work now is as a, as a researcher, as a lecturer. So thank you for having me here. And the reason why I am here, and just to give a very, very quick disclaimer of um, why I'm here and also what who pays me. Um, um, I am, as Kevin said, uh, my name is Sandra Grasse. I did my MSc at the Northern College. I have my sensitive in TCM, and I'm also a fellow of the American Board of Reproductive Medicine. Um, the, I'm on the board of directors of evidence-based acupuncture. You'll all be familiar with Mel Hopper Compliment, also a graduate from the Northern College. And that picture there, um, Kevin might even have been at that table, if not around, 
because that uh, that picture was taken on the evening that I was introduced to everyone as being on the board of uh, EBA. That was at um, one of the conferences in 16 or 17. So that's why we have that uh, that happy picture of uh, just to remind me of how far I've come. So in terms of, um, you know, full disclaimer for, for work and who pays me, as Kevin said, I'm a lecturer at Northern College. I'm a researcher and more prominently, for those who know, will be on the Cochrane Review Group for Acupuncture and IVF. And more importantly, always, always thanking uh, those that helped me and without whom I wouldn't be here. And that would be obviously Professor Hugh McPherson, who in got me um, excited about research in the first place and the uh, um, supervisor for my MSc and currently working on some research projects with me as well, Dr. Larry McClure. And I hope that you all get as inspired about research as I was. And uh, those words are from Lara on um, Hugh's um, website that we prepared when he retired and shortly before he passed away, where uh, Lara said that he has inspired thousands of us. And I am lucky enough to be one of those and having this opportunity that I have now, and you'll see more of this coming up in the next while to actually continue some of his work is quite scary, but also quite interesting. And I'm looking forward to it. Also in terms of research, um, for those who know Dr. Mike Armour, he's originally from New Zealand, but he's in Australia um, at Nickham Institute in uh, Western Sydney University, and has really been the driving force behind uh, all my work in research and lucky enough to have co-authored a couple of papers with him. And it is because of him that I am on the Cochrane Review Group for Acupuncture for IVF. Um, just a little bit of an introduction about EBA and actually my style of, of presenting for those who don't know, um, that, the, that, that head there is uh, my logo for my own work as a lecturer. And I, I love puzzles. I love um, jigsaw puzzles because of all the different pieces coming together. And when they do come together, it forms the picture. Individually, they might not mean much, but when you put them all together, that's where the knowledge comes from. And that quote is there, I don't want to believe, I want to know, because something similar was said by the person who actually started evidence-based acupuncture, and that was Dr. Bartosz Mielniki. For those who know, Bartosz is actually a medical doctor, and at some stage he, he just got tired of being asked all the time, um, when, when he would tell his patients about doing acupuncture, he would, uh, um, he would just get the same reaction that we normally get from patients, which would be, acupuncture do you believe in that and you know more so because he was a medical doctor and he would have people saying to him oh, you're a medical doctor you do acupuncture do you believe in that and he kind of started one of the reasons why he started the, the evidence-based acupuncture project was to show to everyone that it wasn't anything to do with believing it's to do with knowing and here we are now after all those years and and continuing on his work and still honoring him as the person who started eba I had an outline for this presentation, but uh, the reason why these are going to come up in inverted commas, because these are actually from an email from Claire from the ASC. And I really, really like that. And I just tweaked some of the things that I had to present. So introduce the EBA and provide practical tips. Yeah, that's fine. I have some of that. And I actually added a few more uh, slides at the end of how I do it and how I still do it. Uh, enable participants to understand how research can be put into action. Yeah, again, that is there inspire you to communicate with confidence well i am um, i hope so um you know kevin really raised the bar there i think i i, I, I can do this uh, and, and to be honest to communicate with confidence um that is there because that was actually my first i guess like my first job with eba uh, and i remember having this conversation with mel and and kath berry at the time and they were like, you know, you're, you're Portuguese, you're studying Chinese medicine, and you're doing it in English. I think that if anyone can talk about communicating, I think you'll be okay with this. And, and it was always my job, and for those who know me from seeing me online and trying to get the networking and the social media being used in our favor, it's a little bit like that, you know, not being afraid of you know, putting yourself out there and talking about what you do and what you love. It's just, yes, a little bit more confidence in how to do it. How can you use the tools that are already available to do it? And obviously Q&A then at the end. So here's the thing. I will start um, like the real part of the presentation with something that I remember getting. Uh, I think it was preparing a presentation for last uh, um, IFS um, 2021. And 
obviously a lot of people know Dr. Leon and Hammer here in Europe, but obviously in North America is really, really well known. And this was published in 2002, which is really interesting because it's now 20 years old, but it's still really, really out there. And Leon, it's a little bit like my the, the granddad figure that you know comes and always says the right thing at the right time. And this came at a really, really important time for me. And so he wrote this paper in 2002. And he summed up the paper in a small story, which is interesting because my granddad was a great storyteller and here I am now as well. So he said, a little girl once asked her mother why she cut off the end of the roast before putting it in the oven. And the mother said, well, that's because that's the way my mother, your grandmother used to do it. We'll have to ask her. So off they went to grandmother's house only to find out that grandma did it because her mother did it. So the three generations went to great grandma's house in order to seek the wisdom of the ages. And when posed with the question, the great grandma simply chuckled, well, the pan was too small. So this kind of reminded me of really at a time where I was getting more and more involved with research projects and asking practitioners to get their input about what they do in clinics so that we can then do it in research as well. So that research matches what's being done in clinic and kind of wondering that, well, do we know exactly why we're doing the things that we're doing in clinic? Are we just saying it because it's tradition, because someone else did it? I, you know, don't shoot the messenger here. I'm just asking the questions. And Leon said that Chinese medicine needs a new pan for a roast that has grown since ancient times in size and shape, a metaphorical roast that we call the industrial and information revolution. And he gave one of the examples being the tight pulse, no longer a sign of internal cold in our time is a sign of overworking nervous system. Bearing in mind, this was written in 2002. So, you know, 20 years later, we're still kind of looking at the same thing. And what was really interesting is that at that time, I was working at, for, for a company doing webinars online and Elizabeth Hosha was on. And something that she said, again, I took exactly, I went back to play it and take exact words. And she wrote, Chinese classical medicine is not yet finished. We have to continue to edit it. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And she goes, not to invent, but to discover new ways to express. It's not because it's not in the classics that it's not interesting. And then the punchline, and the one thing that we exchanged a good few amount of emails after that was, she said, there are a lot of things that are yet to develop if we want to continue to practice a living medicine and not a dead one. So I think that it's really interesting that you have someone here that you can consider that is someone that coming from, or at least now, standing in the grounds of research and acupuncture research, and actually bringing you information from two scholars of classical Chinese medicine, and saying things, hands up, way, way better than I have ever done to any of my students or online, and going, yeah. This medicine didn't die in the classics. This medicine is alive and it's here now. So we need to adjust to what is here now. So this is my almost like the, the positioning and the background, you know, what some call order, what some call chaos, what's classical, what's modern. Um, my question is, does it work? I love the classics. Um, I, I love to read them. I love to know more about them. They're amazing. I love actually working and doing systematic reviews for Cochrane and getting involved and working with other practitioners all over the world. Do I prefer one over the other? Why should I? I why not use both, right? So you can say, and, and again, just putting it out there, as we all know, some of us will be a little bit more towards one or towards the other one. And there's the ones that we call sometimes the, the, uh, the more classical acupuncturists. And, and I will say something, you, know, you can ask, does it matter? Does it matter if it's the classics or if it's research? I think that it matters that more people need to know about acupuncture. I found this paper really by accident, and that's because of the last name that you see there, Dr. Jun Mao from, well, is one of the leading entities in oncology and acupuncture, but it's from SAR, uh, Society for Acupuncture Research. And when I started reading it, I was like, uh, the most common barriers for uh, breast cancer survivors to get to acupuncture. I honestly thought that it was going to be 
it interferes with their treatment, you know, a common misconception, right? That, you know, it's a needle, so maybe it's painful, you know, are there any side effects, um, you know, the cost, because this is in the US. No, the most, the most, uh, bar most common barrier was actually the lack of knowledge about acupuncture. That is the main barrier for those people to get to acupuncture. And then obviously, this is just taking one of the sentences from the papers, and you'll start seeing that I do that a lot, just taking like one or two key points from it. And um, this is one thing that Deborah Betts always told me that sometimes the researchers can get a couple of sentences in there just to uh, um, kind of have other people pick up on it. And, and this is one for me that is really important that maybe knowing more about acupuncture can get other people that wouldn't be able to access either because of insurance or again, lack of knowledge to actually get acupuncture treatment as well. And this kind of sums up really what we are about in terms of, of um, evidence-based acupuncture. Ancient medicine, modern research, evolutionary thinking was something that came up when we were putting our symposium together a couple of years ago. And this sentence here has been with us forever. Construct a successful evidence-based explanation that helps us to communicate acupuncture's evidence effectively. And what's really important is that we actually look at those three points there, the public, other clinicians, and healthcare policymakers. They all matter at different levels. And to do that, we need to use the language of science. This is where this is one of the points where I'm sorry, but it has to be that. And you know why? Because I love Chinese medicine. I love acupuncture. You all do too. But healthcare policymakers, not so much. Sometimes they're not even medically trained. Sometimes healthcare policymakers come from backgrounds as in law, economy. They know nothing about medicine, let alone traditional Chinese medicine, classical Chinese medicine, acupuncture. They don't care, which is reasonable because that's not their job. We do. And we love to talk about it. So there's terminology that we love to talk about it. But we shouldn't be talking to these people using that terminology because they don't understand it. And they don't have to. It's not their job. So to put this into context, you have to remember that there is a big, huge, wide spectrum out there that goes from papers being published in JAMA about acupuncture being used in the oncology setting. Right. And again, you see the name Jun Mao is there again. So there's that all the way to you know where. OK, and again, Wikipedia, a big fight that Mel has tried and we're not going to win that fight. So is it worthwhile for us to keep banging our heads on that and just focus on that point and ignore everything else that is being published everywhere else? I don't think so. Mel doesn't think so either. No one at EBA does. We just go, OK, we just keep on focusing on the good stuff and just put out all the information out there that is available. There's a book that is called, um, I forgot the author now, but uh, it's a uh, kind of orange book that says, uh, the title is something like Become So Good That They Can't Ignore You. That's kind of our approach. Just let them keep on saying that, but let's just educate everyone else about the other stuff and then let's see how long can they keep ignoring us. Because you have to remember, and this is a slide that was actually taken from Mel's presentations, and I really, I'm a visual type learner, so I really, really like this. A lot of the times you have to think about the way that other people see you as a practitioner, not your colleagues, not where you graduated, not me. How do other people see you? And you have to really ask yourself, is it worth talking to them about anything? So think about what sometimes what other people think about when they look at the word acupuncture. This is something taken from, a, a, I would even call it, you know, as journalist, not really, because this is very dishonest. So on one hand, you have the title and, you know, anyone's entitled to their opinion, that's fine. You know, we can talk about acupuncture for veterans. Uh, it's actually one of the ways that it's used a lot in the US, but that picture, is nothing, absolutely nothing to do with acupuncture. It's not even appropriate to be there because it's not representative of anything. It's not a soldier, it's not, it's not acupuncture. It, it, it has no place there. It's just sensationalist, it's for the shocking, right? So tell me, do you think that it's worthwhile to educate this person? I don't think they want to be educated because if they were, they wouldn't have used that picture, right? 
So you have to be paying attention to these things. And this is the work that we do in the background when you see our posts and when we see who we are targeting with our posts. And here's something from the last while. And just to put it into context, this was before the last US election, okay? So there was this coming up. This was on the, oh, it's a well-known magazine anyway in the US. So this was following Carlos Lopez um, from Mexico, tried to get us, sorry, from Honduras, tried to get across the Mexican border. And all of these are quotes from that interview, by the way, um, or from that piece in, in the magazine. The, the magazine will show it in a second. But on a recent Tuesday, Lopez closed his eyes and slipped into a blank, blissful, meditative piece. Five small needles protruded from each ear. It's pretty good, like a report, you know, reporting from what was happening. You know, it's really tough for all those people waiting at the border, not sure if they were going to come in or not, sometimes with families and whatever. You know, it's really, really intense, like it's, it's emotionally driven. And Lopez said, all the bad thoughts went away as he emerged from his 45 minute long acupuncture session. All I knew is that I was there and that it was relaxed. It was beautiful. That's the picture that came with it, USA Today. Now, does he look like he is in a state of blissful and it's beautiful and it's meditative peace? Are you telling me that no other picture was taken during that intervention and that's the picture that they had to use? That is the picture of calm and it's beautiful. So you have to be careful and you have to find out again, do you fight that or do you go and educate? And for a presentation that I was preparing for a while back, I thought, well, actually to follow that slide, I'll go with all the other stuff that actually came from acupuncture that we have now and we take for granted and that we wouldn't have had if it wasn't for acupuncture. And for those people that say that, oh, there's not enough evidence. Well, let's, let's see. This is from 2016. As you see the lead author there, you'll recognize a lot of the other names on that too. Um, Things that we have, thanks to acupuncture research, uh, neuroimaging research, and uh, especially for chronic pain. But um, yeah, just check the work of um, Vitaly Napadao, like amazing stuff. Um, biomedical knowledge of connective tissue. Again, Helene Langevin, go and look at her. She's actually now in the um, NCCIH. So big position in the US and getting funding for a lot of the work that we get done in terms of not just acupuncture, but in complementary medicine what we have now and knowing about the therapeutic encounters. Again, Professor Hugh McPherson wrote a lot about that. Dr. Vitaly Napadao wrote a lot about that. The fMRI and the encounter between the practitioner and the clinician, which at one stage was told, you know, we were all told that, oh, that's the placebo effect. You know, the practitioner cares about you and looks after you and that's why you get better. Well, why don't, why, do, why don't do all the GPs do that? Why doesn't everyone do that then? If that's the magic, the secret sauce, as Mel calls it, well, why doesn't everyone do that? So then that was the next step. Okay, if that matters, and if you say that that matters, let's see how does that matter? So then fMRI studies and looking at that encounter, it turns out that, yeah, of course it matters. If someone cares about you and they show it, of course it matters. Then you have the TENS machines, again, the Anti-nausea wristbands, that all came from acupuncture research. So those things that some people take for granted, uh, we can just say, you're welcome, I guess. Uh, and again, something that, you know, John McDonald talks a lot about this, and this is the way that um, acupuncture research is going a lot, and that comparative effectiveness research. A lot of the times you see this, and like one of the quickest examples that you can think about is someone getting acupuncture, and instead of comparing with someone getting sham, because, you know, there's a whole new discussion there about sham, just compare that with something else. You know, it could be compared with the group that are taking painkillers, could be compared to a group that are getting usual care. Care, but you're comparing the effectiveness of acupuncture with something else. And luckily, very, very luckily, we should all know this, we can do this now because we have research growing at twice the rate over the last 20 years compared to biomedical research. So we are very, very lucky. And not only it's, it's more, so quantity, we actually know that the quality is better as well because it's being reported in journals that are higher quality journals. So peer reviewed and really high impact journals. 
And we know that the journals that are endorsing the strict, you know, stuff that again came from acupuncturists, again, my Professor Hugh McPherson, that is actually helping the quality of our research as well. And again, go back to the quantity. You've probably all seen this and John keeps updating this all the time and this is amazing. So for anyone, and again, this is the only, this is the only cat fight that I'll get into is for any acupuncturist saying to you or me going, oh, research, no, that's, that's too modern. I don't like that. I don't want to use any of that. So you're going to throw away almost 16,000 pieces of work just because you don't agree with it, because it's modern and it's not classical. And you've heard someone like Dr. Leon Hammer, you've heard someone like Elizabeth, um, 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 Elizabeth Hoshad Lavallee saying that about, we need to keep up with times. You're gonna throw that away because you only read the classics and you're okay with that. Because I'm, I'm not. We still have that problem. And I have that quote there from John, it works in practice, but does it work in theory? Like again, John is great at telling stories and leaving these one-liners there. And yes, we do have that issue when it comes to our practice. We see things happening in the clinic that we find it hard to explain in theory. But does, does that mean that we just give up on explaining it? It's a lot of work there. That, that's from the Cochrane Center of Registral Control Trials. So that's high impact and again, important work being done. I'm not okay with throwing that away. I'm sorry. I, I want more of that. And again, going on how, for example, how EBA selects which conditions to target mainly comes from this. So we target the main eight conditions, although there's 122. So anyone that wants to go at any of those conditions, that's fine. You can. Um, but those are the ones that we target. And those tend to be the ones that have stronger evidence. Um, the other one, 38 more with moderate, and then there is positive, weak positive or unclear in 71. I think that it's really important actually to add is that um, the cost effectiveness, and this is something that, you know, Kevin and I spoke about this recently, and it's really interesting to see that if you're talking to a clinic owner, or as we do, I'm involved with a group of, of acupuncturists that work in hospitals in the U.S., the cost effectiveness is, is that's really, really important for them because they want to know, is this going to be cost effective? We don't want to pay any more than we have to. Right. So that is really, really interesting and really interesting. What John and, and Stephen added to that is safe in the hands of a well-trained practitioner. Again, pay attention to how researchers position their sentences. And, and, and really, really importantly is that over 11 year period, it, the, the evidence has increased for 24 conditions. I hope that if and when they get funding to update that um, acupuncture evidence project, that instead of 24, there's even more there. And that again, depends on all of us. Again, more examples of things that we focus on uh, when, you know, when you get people saying, oh, there's not enough evidence and it's only used in a few places and it's mainly in China or whatever. It's not actually. There's um, there's loads of recommendations, um, you, you know, some most for pain, but there's also 97 for non-pain. Um, and again, government health institutions, national guidelines, medical specialty groups, and this is North America, Europe, and Australasia. So not just China, as we hear all the time. And these recommendations are mostly related to the emergent evidence of the effectiveness of acupuncture. So again, these are kind of like the one sentences that we like to take for our presentations and that are really useful, in our opinion, really useful for you, for your websites, for your talks, um, you know, for your leaflets. When you're talking to people, you know, talk to them about this rather than trying to explain the whole background of classical Chinese medicine and why do we check the pulse and why do we check the tongue? Those are concepts that will take a long time for them to understand, whereas these key points are stuff that they're used to hearing and will be quicker for them to stay engaged and wanting to know more. Because again, we still hear this a lot. You know, I, even after explaining all that, you get the question, but does it work, right? So just to give you an example of how we tackle that, one of the, the first things that we put out was the overview of scientific evidence. And there you see all of this. This is actually just taken from there. I have my um, EBA mug as well. So uh, there's a, a plug uh, there for the EBA shop. Um, but this is actually taken from that page. So normally what we do with the, uh, with the evidence summary is that 
we have it on a page on the website it is also available on pdf which is the one thing that people so if you're on eba connect and you'll see about that in a few minutes then you get access to download that as many times as you want if you're not you can still download it for free but a lot of people actually do donate when they download and it's anything between five dollars to sometimes a hundred sometimes even more which we appreciate because it's what allows us to continue to to do these things and then, you know, things that we discuss and things that you've seen presentation, that gray slide there is actually from one of Mel's presentations. And again, trying to make it as simple as possible with still including a little bit of, you know, we still show the organs, but we don't want to go too much into the organs in Chinese medicine, but we just introduce a little bit of what it is and where it is. So if you're talking about acupuncture and where the needle goes in and, you know, where the point is and what it does, start introducing a little bit, you know, a visual cue for them to go like, oh yeah, now, yeah, I see how that would work. So being visual, but still simple and just try to explain, you've all seen, and I think I have some more of the, 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 the type of the pictures that we have on the, the website and on those evidence summaries as well. And it could be to explain something as you know complex as pure energetic signaling, but still try and have not too much focus on the needle, but what it does in the body. So talk about the function and talk, talk about the end result. A little bit like going to the dentist, right? You don't talk uh, to the dentist about, you know, there's blood everywhere and the mouth is open and the teeth are showing and he's pulling the teeth. No, you show the smile at the end, how it makes you feel better. So kind of that analogy as well with what we're doing with this. And things on the EBA forum, and I see some of the people here are actually on the EBA forum, so they've seen some of this stuff. It can get sometimes complicated. And this is one of the examples of that fMRI study that ended up coming up recently on the forum. And yeah, that's complicated stuff. Do we talk about this on social media? Do we talk about this on you know your normal side of the website? Not really, because it's not appropriate. It, it, it would take too long to explain this. But for us, to know that this exists, that a needle can be inserted in the body at different locations, manipulated, you get different stimulations on the brain, and that's checked with fMRI, that's pretty amazing. Let's talk about that. And by the way, caveat, just in case any of those questions came up, the reason why we do this in the forum and we don't do on social media anymore, there's a lot of the times where the word acupuncture is being blocked, obviously traditional Chinese medicine as well, because of the implication of Chinese. I, we, we decided to take that out of anyone's control and put it on our own you know, controlled environment, which is the EBA forum, where we can all talk to each other about stuff like this. And here it is, the EBA forum, for those that have been there, um, and just a very, very quick overview. This is what it looks like, so just a screenshot of the top. There's a part for EBA announcements where we would say, for example, when one um, evidence summary is out or when a new paper is out. Um, one of the questions that was there from this, I got the screenshot a couple of days ago, can acupuncture help the NHS with pain management? There's a randomized control, that was actually me, randomized champ control trial of manual acupuncture for infertile women with PCOS. Um, that other uh, one that you see there is, um, that's Megan Kingston Gale. She is the head of that hospital group that I told you about. So there's a hospital based acupuncturist in the US and she posted that. Um, that's about one of the Vitaly Napadao studies about the interaction between the patient and the practitioner, because we saw him presenting that at the SAR conference a couple of years ago. So these high, higher level discussions happen in the forum, which is kind of connected pardon the pun, to EBA Connect, where more people might be familiar with that because it exists for a little bit longer, where we have the videos, how to overcome common objections to acupuncture using scientific evidence. Um, there's the, the EBA summaries. Again, the pain was the very, very first one that was out. More recently, we also had cancer pain, which is quite popular, again, because of the link with oncology. Um, allergic rhinitis was something written by um, Dr. John McDonald. That was his thesis for his PhD. And he then transformed that into an evidence summary as well. So these are the things that live on that EBA Connect side of the website. 
And this is something that from day one that we always had. And, and I can understand that some people look at that and think that we are against the flow of chi. And it was interesting because when Mel told me about this the very first time, even before it was public, I said, oh, I love it because it says whatever floats your boat acupuncture works and she was like yeah the few people that i showed this to they didn't like the fact that the flow of chi was scribbled over and i was like oh i didn't even notice that i just went straight to the uh yep yeah, whatever floats your boat acupuncture works choose whatever words you want to it's fine you know the main thing is that acupuncture works and this is where you have to be careful because you need to get people's attention. You need to make sure that they listen to you. And how do you get to them? How do you get their attention? Um, John Weeks was the editor in chief of previously known as the Jack and the Journal of Alternative Complementary Medicine. Now it's a Journal of Integrative and Complementary Medicine. And at our conference, when we were doing the interviews for the start of it, he said to me, and I'll never forget, and we still joke about this to the day, he said to me, Sandro, the research is out there, but who's reading it? And this goes back to that amount of research that I was telling you from you know, Dr. John McDonald putting all that information together. Are you reading it? I'm, you know, I certainly in the last few years, I've reading more and more of that. And I'm fascinated about it. And I, I hope that you are too. So this is my call to you is to be the change and make it count. And why that is important. One of the things that really, really got to me a few years ago, I was preparing a presentation for, actually, here we go. Um, Professor Hugh McPherson wasn't well. I was invited to replace his keynote speech at a conference um, in Austria, where, by the way, they are medical. Um, so to be an acupuncturist, you have to be a medical practitioner. So part of your medical training, you can do Chinese medicine, you can do herbal medicine, acupuncture. They are trained in Chinese medicine acupuncture. And I found this and I was like, you know, laser acupuncture, you know, photobiomodulation was kind of popular at the time. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I don't know those researchers. What do they do? So as I was breaking it down and just to show you how I use it, I look at the paper and I want to know what points they were using. That was always my first thing. And it still is to this day. I want to know how they were doing it. So I look at the points and I go like, oh, OK, so they were using photobiomodulation at those. Oh, cool. They show you the machine. So if you want to go and do it yourself, you can actually do it. It's like the, the, the paper normally gives you like a recipe, like you can go and or should go and do it exactly the same way. And I was like, that's pretty cool. OK, so um, something new for me to look into because it's PCOS and now they're using photobiomodulation. The thing that got me was that where it said the physiotherapist responsible for performing the laser acupuncture. And I was like, oh, a physiotherapist. OK, you know, no disrespect, but could they not get an acupuncturist to do it? And then that made me go back on other papers on PCOS as well. And again, no disrespect. These are researchers that I have highly regard for. And, you know, I, I you know, if the opportunity ever comes to work with them, I yeah, please. The repeated acupuncture treatments this is from Johnson 2013, 30 minutes twice two therapists educated in Western medical acupuncture. I was like, huh, again, why not us doing this? And there's another paper and it says the acupuncture was done by a physical therapist. And I'm like, ah, this is a, this is a thing then. You know, I know this is a, a while ago, 13, 11, but that one with photobiomodulation, that was 2018. So to me, what I want is, again, no disrespect but of, of at all by any of those professions, but I want that being done by you. I want that being done by me. I want that being done by all of us. It doesn't have to be a physiotherapist. It doesn't have to be a physical therapist. We should know, and we should be involved in this stuff. So you matter and how you matter, even as much as you might think that, oh, I never want to be involved in any RCTs, any research at all. Here's how you matter a lot. 2012, I was going to say 2013. So 2012, and um, Jane Littleton was actually involved in this as well. How many, it will be interesting then in the Q&A, how many of you here have gotten a few emails at least saying, hey, would you participate in this research for me? Or there's a survey here about acupuncture. And you go like, oh, don't have time for that. This started as a Delphi, which means that practitioners were asked about what they do and how they do it. OK, what started as a Delphi in 2012 
developed into a randomized control trial. Okay, and it started to shape up things because if you think about for those who are here more involved into fertility and, and particularly IVF, everybody was still using the POLUS protocol. And we're now talking in 2018 where it's, it wasn't even applicable anymore at that stage because the POLUS protocol was for a particular type of IVF that was used in the early 2000s, which nowhere uses it anymore. So it started as a Delphi. Now there's a randomized control trial. Then there's another secondary outcomes looking at anxiety and quality of life. Believe it or not, this was the one that the clinics were really interested in because anxiety and quality of life, that was really what they wanted to change for their patients as well. All the other stuff about IVF, they thought and they think that they can do it in the lab. The anxiety, that was a big, big thing for them. That ended up in a systematic review and meta-analysis that changed the way that acupuncture is now done for people going to IVF treatment, right? It changed completely because again, we can't keep on using the POLIS protocol because that doesn't apply anymore. That ended up on the Cochrane review and it's being updated now. And as I said, I'm part of it. So it is being updated right now. Remember where it started. It started with that email in your inbox asking you to fill in that survey. So please, I know it takes time, but just take those five, 10, 15 minutes it matters. It makes a big, big difference. How I use it for myself, I, I'm, I, I like visuals. So I like to look at those papers and use the pictures for my website, for my presentations. They are biomedical enough, but with the needle still there, it doesn't have to be the needle as in showing them that the needle is this thin or that thick, or that doesn't matter. It's just where the needle goes in and just to showing them, giving them an idea of what it does to the rest of the body. That's how I like to use the research. And for example, here you have something from really, really recent where you solve a problem to the person in front of you. You might have, and I've used this before, again, I'm lucky enough to know Professor Elizabeth Center Victorian and did a presentation with her last year where we spoke about this. There are people there with PCOS that find it really difficult to lose weight and find it really difficult when their practitioner, their clinician says, you need to exercise. And they either can't or have never done, don't feel comfortable. They just, they never start. Here it is, a paper fixing that issue, solving that problem. We can use electroacupuncture, mimicking what exercise would do to them. And that starts that process of losing weight and they can build up to get to a point where it's going to help her. So again, you see, and here, here's another example and Lily Lai actually from the UK is involved in this as well. We're still work, this is still work in, in, in progress, but here it is again, aiming for acupuncture for PCOS it's a really, really high task. It's really complex and it's really, it's gonna take a long, long time. Can we help with weight loss? And this is what the systematic review and meta-analysis is about. What we're looking here is for acupuncture being used for weight loss on people with PCOS. Because aiming for the PCOS itself, it's too much of a high task. And it's almost like, even if we were to come up with something, maybe people wouldn't believe in us. Let's go with the believe again. But if we can help them, with something else that is an issue for those clinicians, which is to get these people to lose weight, maybe we can get our foot in the door. So this is what I do and expertise matters and I'll show you now why it matters. So I studied acupuncture. I had a little bit of biomedicine in my studies as well. We all do. I got more and more interested about it because these are the people that I wanted to work with, the clinicians. Research came into it and it just got more and more and more. The literature, what I call that is everything that was there about TCM. It's still the base, it's still the biggest, but everything else that I do and that I add always has the patient in mind and always at the core. And here's how this matters. And this is for me because of PCOS. The guidelines for PCOS, which are being updated at the moment, include 166 recommendations. 31 are evidence-based, 31. 59 of them were developed by clinical consensus. So it could be like us talking here. 76 were clinical practice points, stuff that you do in the clinic. And this is where I'm gonna be demanding for you is write that stuff down. We need the case studies. We need the case reports from your clinic. 
if you don't believe that that makes a difference, look at this here. The clinical guidelines for PCOS include 76 clinical practice points, not research, not RCTs, not meta-analysis, not systematic reviews, clinical practice points. We need to start developing that base. I had this conversation with Charlie Buck a few years ago, and we were looking at the pyramid and going, we can aim for systematic reviews and meta-analysis at the top of the pyramid. And I love them. That's what I do. But if there's no base, if there's no case studies, and if there's no um, case reports from your clinic, uh, case uh, um, studies, uh, that base is, the base is not big enough, not strong enough. It's not going to hold the rest of the pyramid. So start there and think about things like these, like the one key sentences. Professor Mason said, clinicians, patients, and other stakeholders deserve expert recommendations based on the best available evidence. That's what happens in your clinic all the time. Write that stuff down. Because remember, evidence-based medicine, where our name came from, the evidence-based acupuncture, involves the current best evidence. And again, sorry, not the stuff from the classics, the stuff from now, what you're doing in the clinic now. Even if it's the same as the classics, tell us, show us, write that down. Integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic search. We still need those papers, but we need information coming from the clinics. And this is where you need to train these things. And when people say, oh, there's not enough evidence or it, it, the study wasn't big enough, well, glass half full. These are things that actually I learned from in full credit here to Deborah Betts. This was not an RCT, but isn't it interesting that they found blah, 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 blah. This RCT was only a pilot, but it did demonstrate that blah, 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 blah. Although this was only a small RCT, it was interesting that they found blah, 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 blah. So take away the fact that it was not an RCT, it was only a pilot, it was a small RCT. Take that away from someone straight away and say, yeah, I acknowledge that. But wasn't it interesting that even though it was a small group, they found that. So what will they find if it's a bigger group, right? So here's my question for you. It started with that, and I started reading those, the classics, right? Then I moved on, and again, this is a, tra a trajectory that is probably common to a lot of us. The Giovanni was the first book that I read when I started studying in Portugal. Then I got to know about acupuncture research. Now I'm more involved with Cochrane uh, reviews and, and Cochrane work and, and you know systematic and, and, and that evidence synthesis. These became the classics at different stage. Who's writing tomorrow's classics? In 200 years time, in 2000 years time, when they look back and they look at what the hell were they doing in 2022? Who's writing that stuff? Who's writing what you're doing in the clinic right now? You need to really write that stuff down. And if you need to learn how to do that, well, then there, there are ways of learning that. I'm super proud and super thankful for being here. Um, we worked out a discount for anyone that wants to join the EBA Connect. Again, it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, the work is volunteer. The money goes towards things like our website, the research that goes to put together those um, evidence summaries that you've seen, our talks, our presentations, our videos, all our educational material. That's what we do with it because you know, it, it's a nonprofit. It's not going to be for anyone. It's just towards the work that we produce. So we thank everyone who's already there and anyone that will join and uh, join the party. And I'll leave you with one thing. And, a part, you know, with, first of all, the thanks, but also all that I said here about research and classics and literature, you are clinicians. You spend more time than I do in clinic. And please remember this. This is something that Ray Rubio said. Unfortunately, Ray is no longer with us. He's one of the big, big names on the uh, board of uh, um, the, the ABORM, the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine. And before he passed away, he left us a message. And on that message, he said, patients don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Show them that you care. Write that stuff down. And let's, let's create the classics for the future, please. That is me. Sandro, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we're all feeling extremely fired up and very moved by that very beautiful, beautiful ending. Um, 
Now we've got 10 minutes for questions. Um, we've got one question so far in the chat box. So if you do have a question that you would like to ask um, Sandro, please, please do pop it into the chat and I will make sure that we get it asked. Um, but first of all, we have a question from Andrea Dewhurst, um, which is great, great question. Thank you so much for that. Um, Andrea has done a very big case study on cost effectiveness for clinical commissioning groups um, versus GP time, salary and medication. Um, she would love to know how you approach these CCGs because they're currently just ignoring her. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, here, here comes then the question about how you get that published. Um, uh, th that, that needs to be published. That needs to be put out there. Um, publishing is complicated. It's expensive. And I wouldn't be able to do that on my own. Hence mentioning all those, those names at the start. Um, if the piece of work is that big and that complex, then break that down. Sometimes you have to introduce what the problem is before you tell them what you fixed, because they might not know that there was a problem in the first place. Um, so it might need a little bit of jiggling in terms of creating the background to introduce what the problem was uh, before you show them exactly what you found that can solve that issue. I'm happy to try, you know, in terms of research within all my limitations, but if it takes, you know, networking with someone to try and help with getting that published, yeah, for sure. You, you need to get the word out there. But remember, again, it's a little bit like going with your TCM knowledge and explain how you can um, help everyone because you're really good at helping with liver chi and everyone is really, you're introducing a solution that people don't even know what the problem was. So you might need to reward that a little bit before then you introduce the solution. So Sandra, when you're talking about um, publishing, do you, do you mean publishing in journals? Yes. Yes. Because okay. again, uh, you might not agree with it, but that's what other people are reading. So and are there any particular journals that might be more open-minded to yeah, receiving there, this sort of work? Yeah, there are. So this is, um, yeah. So this is part of, of knowing and kind of like the, the, the background of being a, a researcher, even for early career, like myself, knowing where you're going to go and publish those things comes from what the journal scope is. OK, so that's that's work that as a researcher uh, and again, remember, you're a clinician researcher. It doesn't matter how big or how small you are. That's what you are. You just need to do that work. Um, cost effectiveness. Again, it would have to be something that I would have to go and look for and find out exactly what would be the best option. But yeah, you have to publish in the best impact possible. So I, I, I do that myself, which is have two or three journals and aim for the stars first aim for the one that you think that you know this is probably not going to work but i'm going to go for it that doesn't work fine go to the next one that doesn't work fine go to the next one you know we all get rejections at all stages so it's fine mm. um you mentioned case studies mm -hmm. um what so what sort of things are helpful for us to include in our case studies and what is the best way for us to disseminate these these great these jewels? great great question i'm glad you mentioned that because that's not part of, that wasn't part of this presentation the amazing thing that uh, you all see and i see some of the names here and i might be shooting myself in the foot by saying this because you might be thinking that god this guy knows loads and whatever and um, there's there are checklists for everything. <laughs> so there, there are actually checklists for you to write a case, a, a case study, a case report. So if you look at case hyphen, sorry, care. So it's for case report, C-A-R-E. So care hyphen statement dot org. That website will actually give you a checklist of what you need to include for a case report. So when you're thinking about, oh, I don't know how to write one, I don't know what to include, um, things like AccuTrack, for example, for those who know and were using it before, MyMop as well, although MyMop is a little bit more complicated to really gather evidence. So AccuTrack is really, I, I no affiliation whatsoever. I know them. I love the work that they're doing, and I think it's a great way of moving forward. Um, so, yeah. You just you just need to look at the, the guidelines and look at the checklist 
and it will tell you what you need to gather from your encounter with that patient and what you need to write down. I love that. Just a simple checklist. It sort of removes a lot of the guesswork. And a lot I know, of the Kevin, but it also it also takes away the shine from, wow, this guy knows all this <laughs> and he's great. And then I'm telling you that I just look at websites with checklists. Right. It doesn't, you know. <laughs> OK, we um, I, I had a couple of questions come through yep. to us earlier on. OK, so um, we've got five minutes because we're going to end dead on time. Thanks so much, Kath, for letting us know. Bye bye. Um, so how do you feel that um, what's the impact been of of acupuncture research in getting some hospitals to have acupuncture as part of their integrated care package? It's been amazing, and I'm glad that that question is out there. So I was super surprised, still am, to see the amount of work that the, the peeps can do over in America. So in the US, there is a group um, of uh, acupuncturists that they stay relatively low key, so you don't hear about it much on social media or anything like that, um, and they work in hospital settings. And... The main thing, for example, that really helped them, and, and by the way, just to give you an example, the reason why, because some of you might be thinking this, and I still ask this question to myself a lot, is why the hell am I even part of that? Is I, I'm, I'm not in the US and I don't work in a hospital. The closest ever was working in a fertility clinic in Ireland, not in the US. The reason being is that they wanted to get as much evidence translation as possible. The reason why they wanted that is because they wanted to participate in the big meetings with all the other people that work in the hospital so that they could feel included. So for them, one of apart from the evidence and knowing that, yes, you have the classics and yes, we have individualized treatments and we can do manualization with with research as well. And a lot of them are most of them are TCM trained. The key for them was to be able to participate in a journal club, knowing what the terminology was about, being able to tell them that when someone is talking about a particular paper, being able to put their hands up and say, oh, actually, uh, we do actually have some research on acupuncture for that particular condition. Would you like to see it? So that was one of the key things. And then obviously, once you're in and once you're talking that language with them, even stuff like cost effectiveness, right? Like one of the things that, again, Kevin, we spoke about this recently, there was some hospitals would have and some insurances in the US would have this issue about someone gets treated in the hospital, like briefly, and this is very, very generalizing. Someone gets treated in the hospital, their health insurance either pays or doesn't pay, and they need to go and get a bank loan to pay for that, because as we know, it's very, very expensive in the US, but they are in the hospital, they get treatment. There are, this is very generalizing, but there are places where if you go back to the hospital within 30 days with the same complaint, because you're still not okay, that means that the hospital has to pay for that because it's almost like you didn't do a good job. It's not even 30 days. And here I am with the same problem. One of the things that they found that acupuncture is great for, and I know this is going to sound terrible, was to those people not coming back within those 30 days because they were getting acupuncture alongside their normal treatments. And then they were feeling better for longer. Q in research from Professor McPherson, Andrew Vickers, all that sort of stuff that we know from acupuncture lasting three months, six months, a year. And for the hospitals, they were like, this is amazing. We don't have to pay for this anymore. They come in, they get their treatment. We get the money either from them or from the health insurance. They go away and they do not come back within 30 days anymore. They might come back in six months, a year, two years or something different. It is what it is. It's the healthcare system that they have, right? So how to use research? You have to be inventive and there is always a way. Always away. What a wonderfully positive note for us to end on. I promised that we would end on time and I like to keep my promises. Um, so um, we do have some more questions in the chat box and also from that were forwarded to me earlier on. So Sandro, we will talk um, afterwards. I'll share those with you. Yep. And um, Sandro's got some homework. Let's just say that. He's oh, okay. Um, Sandro Grasser. It has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your enthusiasm with us so very, very generously. And a very big thank you to our marvelous, marvelous AAC members. 
It's always lovely to see you. Um, thank you for your energy for showing up um, at dinner time as well. Um, so um, yes, until the next time, um, thank you so much and have a very, very wonderful evening. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you everyone, bye. Thank you very much, that was great. <laughs>